Uh, welcome to Grand Rounds for our annual Department of Medicine Research Day. I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Martin Blazer, Professor of Medicine and Microbiology and the Director of the Human Microbiome Program at the NYU School of Medicine for his Grand Rounds on the Paradox of Antibiotics. Dr. Blazer served as Chair of the Department of Medicine at NYU as well as President of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, Chair of the Board of Scientific Counselors of the National Cancer Institute, and Chair of the Advisory Board for Clinical Research of the NIH. He actively studies the relationship of the human microbiome with health and with important diseases such as asthma, obesity, diabetes, allergies, and cancer. Dr. Blazer has mentored many students, fellows, and junior faculty in the field. He holds many U.S. patents and has authored a multitude of original articles. Most recently, Dr. Blazer wrote Missing Microbes, a book bringing education on the overuse of antibiotics to the general public. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Blazer. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> good morning, Dr. Hilberg. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. I see many familiar faces in the audience. So uh, it's, it's, I, I grew up in New York. I was born about a mile from here. Uh, so it's like it's a return to home. I particularly want to recognize uh, my friend Jeff Ponell from elementary school, my friend Nancy H Hanno from college, Barry Kohler, who was my resident when I was a medical student at, uh, at NYU. So uh, uh, my mother isn't alive anymore, but that would have completed the picture. So um, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's my uh, honor and privilege to speak here today. And uh, I'm going to tell you about our work uh, about the microbiome. And uh, I, I've titled this talk, The Antibiotic Paradox. Uh, I, I hope you'll understand why uh, after a while. Uh, and, um, uh, and just tell you that I think uh, in a career of, of more than 40 years of research, uh, I'm, I think this is the most important work that I've done in my whole career. So uh, you may or may not agree. But uh, so let's begin. And, and since I'm amongst all these friends, <laughs> Let's get serious. Okay, so, um, so what I want to discuss today is a phenomenon that all of us are aware of, the lay public is aware of, and that is that a number of diseases have increased dramatically in the period after World War II. Here are three examples. Uh, type 1 diabetes, doubling every 20 to 25 years, asthma, uh, going through the roof, uh, reflux disease wasn't even in the medical literature until the 1930s, going up dramatically with cancers downstream of that. So one of the questions is, is what's causing all of this? And I also want to focus now on another uh, uh, epidemic disease, and that is obesity. This slide looks at obesity trends in, in U.S. adults, uh, which we could consider a form of changing human physiology. All of you are familiar with MAPS these maps are maps like these. Uh, in 1989, there's no state in the United States where more than 14% of adults are obese. By 2010, there's no state with less than 20% obesity, and the national average is 30%. What's remarkable is that it's happening everywhere, uh, and the difference between the first map and the last map is only 21 years. Something powerful is happening. We know that obesity in adults begins in childhood, and I can show, there, there's a lot of data on this, but I'll just show you this one slide from review of uh, N. Haynes studies <clears throat> over 35 years looking at obesity trends in U.S. children and adolescents. And even in the very youngest children, under five, you can see which way the trend is going. So childhood obesity leads to adolescent obesity, leads to adult obesity. Here are data looking at overweight children under five around the world. The red line is kids in developed countries, so 2015, about 13 uh, percent of the kids are uh, uh, greater than two standard deviations uh, <coughs> uh, uh, higher in a, a high area for weight for height. Uh, and in developing countries, the, the, the numbers are less. 
but you can see the trend line. And in fact, if you see where they are, the developing countries are today, it's exactly where the developed countries were 30 years ago. It suggests it's the same phenomenon, but it has been delayed by 30 years. These are the rates. Here are the numbers. So if you look at the number of kids uh, meeting this criteria around the world, it turns out that today about 80% of those kids are in developing countries. And in a few years, it's going to be 90% because of the tremendous population growth in developing countries. So obesity is not just a US uh, uh, epidemic. It is pandemic. Uh, now, I also want to talk about inflammatory bowel disease, a disease that's uh, uh, important all over the world, especially at this hospital with the work of Dr. Crone. So uh, this, uh, this review from Dr. Kaplan et al., who was uh, mentored by Dr. Sands, I believe, uh, uh, shows that uh, IBD began in the 19th century in the Western world and began later uh, in developing, in the newly industrialized countries. And again, this is part of this phenomenon of uh, delayed uh, of modern of disease coming with modernization, and really, essentially, two waves of modernization: the the first wave in the Western countries and the second wave around the world. Now, how can we explain this? And I I want to uh, to tie these diseases and the rise of these diseases to changes in the human microbiome. And uh, to explain that, I want to introduce three concepts. The first is evolution. So this slide looks at the evolutionary relationships of wild hominids. This is work by Howard Ackman and colleagues. On the left side is a phylogeny of, of, of uh, human uh, of hominids. Here's one wild hominid, for example. This phylogeny has a particular topology. Now, if you look at the phylogeny of the fecal microbiota and you look at the topology, you'll see that it's highly congruent. So this congruence is strong evidence for the vertical transmission of the microbiota. It is also evidence supporting the idea uh, of coevolution between microbe and host. And the period of time encompassed in this slide is about 8 million years. So this, these are, these are long-standing, these are ancient relationships. Second concept is a concept of equilibrium, and this is from work that I've done with Denise Kirshner, a mathematician. Our view of co-evolved microbes are microbes that are interacting, that are talking to the host. They're sending signals. They may be chemical or physical signals. The host is signaling back. These may be defense molecules or other chemical signals. We've modeled this as an equilibrium. Denise has shown it's a dynamic equilibrium. She has shown that under many physiologic circumstances, it's robust and resilient. The question is, what happens when it's lost? What happens to the physiology of the host when co-evolved microbes become lost, when they become extinct? Third concept is the concept of age window. And this, uh, there's been a lot of work on this, but I want to focus on the work by Jeff Gordon and his colleagues uh, in this paper by Tadnya Yatsenenko involving Rob Knight, Maria Gloria Dominguez, and others. This is a study of people in the US, Amer Indians in South America, Malawians in Africa. Uh, uh, every circle uh, in this graph is the composite of the gut microbiome in one individual. The uh, x-axis is age and childhood. The y-axis is called unifrac distance between children and adults. This is a measure of dissimilarity. What the data clearly show is that the population structure in young children is very unadult-like. And then gradually and progressively, it becomes more and more adult-like until it is. And what's remarkable about this study is that the age of transition is the age of three. The first three years of life is when the microbiome is developing its adult form. It is the most dynamic. It is also the period of life when babies are developing. They're developing their metabolism, their immunity, and their cognition. So let's get back to this vertical transmission of the microbiota from mother to child. So uh, we humans are mammals. We're born in a womb which is sterile or mostly sterile, our first exposure to the world of bacteria happens when the water breaks. When the baby descends through the birth canal, they're covered by the mom's microbes. They swallow the microbes. Their skin-to-skin -skin contact 
of mom and baby. The baby's mouth full of microbes inoculates the breast and now microbes and substrate go in to form the foundations of the GI tract microbiota. Moms are kissing babies, they're licking babies, they're pre-masticating food. Lots of redundant ways of transferring microbes across generations. This is the way it's always been for all mammals and in fact really for all animals. But these days moms are different than they used to be. Moms live in a world of antisepsis. They've received many courses of antibiotics, often during pregnancy and just before. They're on a diet that's full of antibacterials. And babies are different too. Babies may be born by cesarean section, missing that passage through the birth canal. In the United States today, one baby out of three is born by C-section. In many countries in the world, the rate of C-section is greater than 50%. So this is a big, big change in human ecology. Babies are bathed extensively. They're given formula which superficially resembles breast milk but have, did not have the advantages of millions of years of co-evolution. And of course, babies are getting lots of antibiotics, which I'll be talking about. So based on these kind of changes in, in the transmission of, of the microbiota, over the last 20 years, I've been developing an idea that I call the theory of the disappearing microbiota. This theory has two major tenets. The first is that changed human ecology has altered the transmission and maintenance of our ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And the second is that especially important are microbes usually acquired early in life, since they affect a developmentally critical stage. A few years ago, working with uh, another microbiologist, Dr. Stan Falco, we have uh, enlarged this hypothesis, which is shown here, the effect of maternal status on the resident microbiota of the next generation. Our idea of ancient moms is that they had an ancient microbiota, but if they happened to lose microbes and they couldn't be acquired horizontally, then the next generation would be born at a deficit, and so on and so forth. So this is our view for what has happened during the 20th century. Instead of the clock resetting with each generation, the changes in the generations are cumulative. So if this is true, maybe it's important. Is it true? Well, here we're now going to look at the prevalence of Helicobacter pylori in three generations in Japanese families. Helicobacter pylori used to be the dominant organism in the human stomach but now has been disappearing. And you can see the same kind of stepwise loss that we have postulated. We can also look at the overall diversity of the microbiota. And this is work from Jose Clemente uh, there. Uh, uh, Jose Clemente and Maria Gloria Dominguez and colleagues who have looked at, uh, at healthy people in the US village people in Malawi and in Venezuela, and an uncontacted group of Amerindians in, in the Venezuelan Amazon. These people have never had any antibiotics or any form of, of modernization of health care uh, on their first contact. And here's a measure of diversity. Here are the people in the US. Here are the uncontacted Amerindians. They have much more diversity than we do. And you can see, you can almost imagine kind of a step down. Now recently, uh, uh, Sam Smits and colleagues in Justin Sonnenberg's group at Stanford have, com have done a comparison of the microbiota in many different populations. The, many of this was archival. Uh, and this Bray-Curtis comparison is also kind of an index of diversity from the, these are the populations that have the least diversity of the microbiota. These have the most diversity. The ones with the asterisks are the ones I showed you in the previous slide. and and. I've taken the liberty of putting two boxes here. This top box, these are people with, th this is the group with the highest diversity. These are people in developing countries. And the bottom box are people in developed countries. Now, this is not specific to diet or geography. The develop people in the developing countries live on three continents here. They're of all different ethnicities. The people in the developed countries live on four continents, all different diets and ethnicities. The difference seems to be about modernization. Most diverse, most ancestral, presumably least. 
So what could be causing this? I think there are multiple factors causing this associated with modernization, but I'm just going to talk about one, antibiotics. All of us know about antibiotics as one of the greatest discoveries of humankind in the 20th century. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Fleming reenacting the discovery of penicillin. Uh, <laughs> Antibiotics are central to all aspects of medicine. They've saved countless lives. They've revolutionized every aspect of medicine. And as a result, health practitioners are using antibiotics more and more and more. So how much more? Well, a recent estimate is that we're using about 73 billion antibiotic doses a year in the world. That's 10 doses for every man, woman, and child on the planet every year, and actually the numbers are going up. In the U.S., the CDC actually took a count of outpatient antibiotic courses, 262 million. That's 842 courses per thousand population. That's five courses for every six people year after year. In children, uh, the estimate is about, in the U.S., about three courses by the age of two, ten courses by the age of ten. There are many <coughs> estimates that show this. Pregnancy, pregnant women, more than 50% in the U.S. are getting antibiotics before or during pregnancy, just before the intergenerational transfer of the microbiota. And of course, there are a lot of exposures from antibiotic use on the farm, scale unknown. We don't, we don't haven't even determined what this is. Now we think about antibiotics as modernization, but in fact, antibiotics are present all over the world. This is a picture I took in the Peru Peruvian Amazon, deep in the jungle, <laughs> between the drinks and the batteries. Here are the antibiotics, uh, generic, over-the-counter, available to anybody who's willing to pay. Now here's a recent study funded by the Gates Foundation looking at children in poor countries of the world. In, uh, slum, in slum and other urban populations. Here we're looking at the first two years of life. Here we're looking at antibiotic courses per person year. This, this, uh, uh, this population, Venda, this is about the U.S. rate in children. But the rates in most populations are higher. In fact, in, in this population in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, there's the average number of courses of antibiotics in the first year of life is about 10. So the amount of antibiotics that are now permeating the system in developing countries uh, is <coughs> remarkable. So what I'm going to talk about, this is all my introduction, uh, is, the, uh, is the paradoxical effects of antibiotics. Uh, uh, we give antibiotics with good intentions, but I'm going to present evidence that antibiotics can affect metabolic and immunologic development that they can increase susceptibility to subsequent infections, and that the effects of antibiotics can be passed to the next generation via the altered microbiome. So let me start on the farm. Seventy years ago, farmers discovered that antibiotics changed the metabolism of their farm animals. Antibiotics promote growth. That's why they're so widely used on the farm, as growth promoters. They found that it works from chickens to cows, a wide swath of vertebrate evolution. It works with just about any antibacterial that has been looked at, regardless of its chemical structure, class, target, or spectrum. Antivirals don't work. Antifungals don't work. What's important is that the earlier in life the antibiotics are started, the bigger the effect on growth rate and on feed efficiency. That's the conversion of food calories into body mass. That's what farmers are trying to do. They're trying to grow animals faster. Uh, when we looked at this, this suggested a developmental phenomenon. So we began to do studies in mice in which we would give mice antibiotics or not. We'd examine properties, we'd look at the microbiome, we'd find relationships. And so for essentially the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a series of experiments in mice that test the effects of antibiotics. Our first studies were done uh, by Dr. Il-Sung Cho when he was a fellow in my lab. He's now on the faculty in GI at NYU. Il-Sung gave four different antibiotic regimens at the midpoint of the FDA-approved dose on the farm to experimental mice, or not. And here, he's looking at percent body fat. And we can see, here's the control, here are the antibiotic groups. They have more fat. We can see it in this representation. 
This was our first evidence that antibiotics were changing metabolism in the mouse model. Il Ilsung's work showed a lot of other things, but I want to move on to the next study. And this was a study that Laurie Cox did when she was a graduate student in the lab. Laurie wanted to ask, well, what's the effect of combining a diet that's rich in calories, high in fat, and antibiotics? So she did an experiment which we called FATSTAT to compare the low-dose antibiotic exposure used on the farm. She used low-dose penicillin or not. She put all the mice on normal chow and at week 17 put half the mice on a high-fat diet. Here's the results for phenotype. Male mice and female mice, total mass, fat mass, and lean mass. If we start with the male mice, the control group, no antibiotics, normal chow, that's the black line. Normal chow and antibiotics, they're bigger, just like on the farm. High fat diet, bigger still, high fat plus antibiotics, big est. Lean mass, increased on antibiotics, just like on the farm. Fat mass, big increase on the high fat diet, even more high fat plus antibiotics. Female mice, many of the same trends, a focus on fat mass, the average female mouse on the high fat diet, five grams of body fat, high fat plus antibiotics, 10 grams. They doubled the amount of body fat. The antibiotic potentiated the effect of the high fat diet. We see effects downstream in the liver as well. Up to this point, the mice were getting antibiotics for their entire life. That's not so physiological. So uh, Lori next did an experiment in which in addition to mice getting no antibiotics, or lifelong antibiotics, they got only eight weeks of antibiotics or only four weeks of antibiotics. Here are the effects on mass, total, lean, and fat mass. Black line is the control group. What Laurie found is that all three groups of mice that received antibiotics had increased total, lean, and fat mass. So four weeks early in life was sufficient for the full effect. We were interested in the effects of these regimens on the intestine. And this is work that Jackie Leung did in Pung Lok's lab, looking at the effects of STAT on intestinal TH17 populations, shown here by flow cytometry, small intestine, large intestine. I guess the microphone is working now. Uh, and uh, however we measure TH17, it's down in the antibiotic groups. And you're, you're going to see this again and again. So what about the microbiome? So here we're going to look at the fe fecal community structure in the, in the experimental mice that are three weeks old. And at three weeks, there are essentially only two groups of mice, control mice, no antibiotics. All three antibiotic groups are still receiving the antibiotic. So here in this principal coordinates analysis, the black dots are the control mice, the orange are those receiving the antibiotics. There's a lot of diversity between the mice. There's some general overlap between the antibiotic and not, but they're a little shifted, which is not surprising. One group is getting antibiotics, the other group is not. Now we're going to turn to eight weeks. And at eight weeks, there are three groups of mice. Control mice, no antibiotics. Continued antibiotics, or four weeks of antibiotics, and then stop. So now we look at the controls. They're here in black. The antibiotic group is even more shifted, more exposure to antibiotics, not surprising. But the group that had antibiotics and stopped, their microbiota has normalized. So the effect of, the antibiotic, of this antibiotic regimen on the mice was transient on, on their microbiome. But the effect on their phenotype was permanent. So this provides evidence that altering the microbiome during a critical early period of development has long-term consequences. So, is this an antibiotic effect or is it a microbiota effect, an issue that I'll come back to a few times? So to resolve that question, we did a, 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 a sequel transplant. This would be the FMT of mice. So uh, uh, mice received antibiotics or not. We sacrificed the mice. We harvested their sequel contents, and we transferred <laughs> them to germ-free mice and followed them for the next five weeks. And importantly, these mice never saw an antibiotic. Here we're looking at total, lean, and fat mass. What, the black line is the, is the control group. What we found is that the mice that had a perturbed, uh, the, the microbiota that was perturbed, increased total mass, no effect on lean mass, increased fat mass. So we have evidence that the perturbed microbiota is conferring the phenotype. What about immunity? 
Here we're looking at the expression of genes involved in intestinal defenses in the first in the donor mice. So we're looking at genes involved with Th17, transcription factor, two cytokines, antimicrobial peptides downstream of Th17. In the donor mice, we found this, this decrease with STAT as we've come to expect. What about the recipient mice that got the fecal transplant, cecal transplant? Here we see the same trends. So this provides evidence that the immunological phenotype is transmissible by the microbiota as well. Now, up to this point, I've shown you work with the farm model, the STAT model, low doses of antibiotics every day in the drinking water. But human children get pulses of antibiotics to treat their ear infections and their throat infections. So Yael Noble, a student in the lab, developed a second model that we called PAT for pulsed antibiotic treatment, and we can schematize it as follows. Her hypothesis was that a series of short therapeutic dose courses of antibiotics administered early in life will sufficiently change the gut microbiome to alter host phenotypes. Yael showed many things. It's in her publication, uh, but I'm just showing this to es establish the model because I really want to talk about the next paper by Victoria Ruiz, who was a postdoc in the lab. Yael's work was with three pulses of antibiotics, and she found many effects. Uh, Victoria asked, what happens if she just gives one pulse of antibiotics very early in life? Will that have an effect? And so she gave them pulses of antibiotics, three or one or none, and sacrificed them around day 50 of life. First, in this principal coordinates analysis, let's look at the microbiota at day 52. Here's the control group in black. Here are the antibiotic groups, three pulses or one pulse. Uh, they, unlike the subtherapeutic antibiotics, they haven't normalized. Their microbiota is still perturbed 40 days after the single antibiotic pulse. So they, the microbiota, in this case, is not very resilient. So now Victoria asks, what's the effect of the antibiotic on, on the host, on gene expression in the host? So here we're looking at a heat map uh, based on the uh, nanostring encounter assay, uh, looking at 547 uh, genes uh, in, in, in mice that are uh, related to immunity and um, inflammation. This is an unsupervised hierarchical clustering, uh, clustering all by themselves, so the control mice, the, all the antibiotic mice form a single cluster. Uh, whether it's one or three courses, you can see this very clearly. 147 differentially expressed genes. By the way, this is at day 50 of life. Um, most of them were with three courses of antibiotics, but about half with one course. If we look at specific immunological phenotypes, here's the polymeric immunoglobulin receptor on epithelial cells. Here's control. Here's one PAT. Here's three PAT. Here's intestinal secretory IgA on day 27. It's down with PAT. By day 40, it's maturing in the controls, but it's, it's decreased in those receiving the antibiotics. TH17 down again, even with a single course. Now, as part of this experiment, uh, Victoria <coughs> had the opportunity to ask a very interesting question. <coughs> the mice got their uh, antibiotic in the drinking water, so the moms actually got the antibiotic and passed it through their milk to the pups. And so we could compare the moms and the pups who either got the antibiotic or not. And she asked, how does this affect gene expression around day 50 of life, 40 days after the antibiotic? So here, is, uh, here are volcano plots of RNA-seq analysis on the dams and on the pups. And on day 50, we see that in the dams, there's still about 100 genes that are significantly different between antibiotic and control. But in the pups, there are 1,300 genes that are different. There's an order of magnitude greater effect on the pups than on the dams um, <clears throat> with the same temporal relationship of the exposure. The, the pups are babies. <clears throat> they are, their microbiome isn't resilient. Uh, their gene expression doesn't seem to be resilient. <clears throat> so is this an antibiotic effect or is this a microbiome effect? So to test this phenomenon, Victoria gave the antibiotic to germ-free mice or not, and as a control, she gave the antibiotic or not to SPF mice from day 5 to 10, following them to sacrifice 40 days later. So here's the unsupervised clustering of, of the nanostrings. Here are 
conventional mice, no antibiotics. This is the, these are the normal mice. Here are the germ-free mice. They cluster together whether they're on antibiotics or not. There doesn't seem to be any effect of the antibiotics in a germ-free animal, suggesting you need a microbiome for the effect. Here, <clears throat> here are the mice, the conventional mice that received antibiotics. Even 40 days later, they're clustering with germ-free. We could see this a little better uh, here in this uh, PCA. Uh, here are the conventional mice, here are the germ-free mice, here are the antibiotic-treated conventional mice. Effects uh, on TH17 in the SPF mice down as expected, no effects in the germ-free mice. All of this provides evidence that having a microbiota is necessary for the immunologic effects that we're seeing. So the question then is, is it sufficient? So to answer that question, uh, Isaac Eggenstrand, who is a visiting student from Karolinska, did an experiment in which he gave mice antibiotics or not, and two days later he sacrificed the mice, he harvested their cecal contents, and he gave these to a new set of germ-free mice, who he then followed for the next 77 days. Here we're going to look at two different phenomena, TCR beta positive splenocytes, down 77 days after the transfer in PAT, fecal IgA in the mice that got the normal microbiota increase normally reach a plateau. You can see that the increase is delayed uh, and the plateau is lower in the mice that got the perturbed microbiota. So this is evidence that having an altered microbiota is sufficient, at least for some of the immunologic phenotypes. Now, <clears throat> this, is, this, is all, uh, this is all work in models, and it's about immunological markers. Well, but, but how? We're interested in immunology in terms of immunity to infection. How, how, does, how, how is that affected? So Claire Robot, uh, a visiting scholar from the University of Bordeaux, uh, was examining the, the known phenomena that the gut microbiota have a role in infection, in defense against infection, just like the immune system and like other factors in the epithelium. So she asked, what happens if she gives antibiotics that perturb the microbiota? What will, what will happen to resistance to subsequent infection? So she tested this in, in a model of colitis due to the, the mouse pathogen Citrobacter rodentium, uh, uh, an Enterobacteriaceae, a proteobacterium. Um, <clears throat> so in her experiment, she gave antibiotic or not to mice, and then she followed it by a C. rodentium challenge. Either the challenge was either one day after the antibiotics, or 23 days after the antibiotics, or 80 days after the antibiotics, and she measured many different phenomena. So first we're going to look at the effects of the antibiotic exposure with the challenge just one day later. So here are the challenges with water or with tylosin, a macrolide antibiotic. Here's a challenge one day later. Here's weight. The mice not challenged with C. rodentium gain weight. The mice with C. rodentium don't gain weight, and eventually they lose weight. But you can see their, their weight curve alters faster on the tylosin. Here is colonization with C. rodentium. In the mice that received water, it goes up slowly, reaching a plateau. It goes up l much faster. This is a log scale uh, in, uh, in the mice that received the antibiotics. We can see this on these uh, uh, scans using luciferase-labeled bacteria. Here's LB broth alone, no bacteria, no luminescence. Here's the water group. You can see that gradually they're ac acquiring the organism. Here's with tylosin. You see it's much faster, more rapidly. So this is one day after challenge. Now how about 22 days after challenge? Here's the challenge. Now we're looking at C. rodentium load in feces. Here's the, uh, the water group, uh, amoxicillin, tylosin. You can see the tylosin, this again a log scale. It's up about two lobs. It's going up faster. Blood in feces, more in the antibiotic groups than in the control group. How about 80 days later? Here's C. rodentium load in the feces. Uh, um, again, here's the tylosin group. It's up a log. So this is 80 days after the antibiotic challenge. Here's weight loss. The mice that don't receive C. rodentium don't lose weight. C. rodentium, after water, they're losing a little, but after antibiotics, they're, they're losing significantly more, especially with the macrolide. So is this an antibiotic effect or is it a microbiome effect? So, um, <clears throat> so Claire did an experiment. Uh, where she gave mice macrolide or not, 
sacrificed the mice 23 days later and harvested their cecal contents and gave these to germ-free mice, and five days later challenged them with C. rodentium. Here are the, some of the phenotypes. Here's C. rodentium load. You see it's higher uh, in, the, in the mice that got the perturbed microbiota. Uh, weight change, more loss in those that got the microbiota. Blood in the feces, significantly faster and more in the mice that got uh, the perturbed microbiota. So all of these are, provide evidence that, that the antibiotic is having a paradoxical effect on, on resistance to pathogens. And this phenomena has been recognized for at least 50 years, uh, but now uh, we're putting it more into the microbiome era. Uh, I, I want to mention uh, just one other study on type 1 diabetes. Uh, uh, this is work done by Alexandra Lovanos, who is an MD-PhD student in my lab. Uh, Ali is coming here in July to be a GI fellow, so uh, I, I want to give her that shout out. Ali's the uh, hypothesis was that antibiotics promote type 1 diabetes. She studied it in nod mice that are genetically susceptible to getting type 1 diabetes. Her hypothesis is that early life antibiotics will change the gut microbiome, they'll change intestinal gene expression, change T cell subtypes, and enhance type 1 diabetes. And Ali showed every part of this hypothesis, and this work was published a couple of years ago. The final study I want to show you has to do with IBD. So, uh, there have been a number of studies, uh, <coughs> epidemiologic studies, linking antibiotic use to IBD risk. Uh, <coughs> here's a study of all the children born in Denmark over a nine-year period. Uh, <coughs> and Hivit and colleagues showed that the more courses of antibiotics that kids got in the first year of life, the more likely they were to develop IBD, especially Crohn's disease. So our question is, can an antibiotic-altered microbiota affect IBD outcome? And actually, we took it a step further. We wanted to see, could it have an effect in the next generation? So we did this by studying IL-10 knockout mice that, are, uh, spont that, are, that spontaneously develop uh, colitis. We got these mice from our collaborator, Balfour Sarder, from North Carolina. And we did an experiment in which we wanted to conventionalize germ-free mice that were either wild-type or IL-10 deficient with perturbed or normal microbiota. So this work uh, was done by Angel Schulfer, who was a graduate student in the lab. Uh, she used germ-free wild-type or IL-10 deficient mice. She gave them either control or antibiotic perturbed microbiota. Uh, but in this experiment, uh, uh, what uh, we did that I think is most interesting is that the mice who received the microbiota were pregnant. So, uh, so we were, we're, we're conventionalizing pregnant mice before the birth of the next generation. So two genotypes, two inocula, we have four experimental groups. The, the, we did the conventionalization. The mice gave birth uh, to their pups in due course. And then we followed the pups when they were about uh, up to uh, week 21 of life, when they're middle-aged. And really, we wanted to ask two questions. What's the effect of the perturbed microbiota on the ecology of the gut? And what, what are the effects on disease? So first, the ecology of the gut. Uh, here, we're going to look at <clears throat> the transfer efficiency from the inoculum to the pups. Here's the control inoculum. Here is the stat inoculum. They're different, as expected. Now, here are the wild-type animals that receive the control inoculum. They're clustering here in this quarter. You can see the dams and the pups. Now here are the wild-type uh, animals that got the stat inoculum. They're clustering here. They're, they're distinct from the other. So the genotype is having, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, the inoculum is having an effect on, on the population structure. Now we're going to look at the IL-10 mice that got the control inoculum. They're in this quadrant and the IL-10 mice that got the stat inoculum, they're in this quadrant, but they're kind of spread out. The IL-10 can't control the diversity quite as much. So we can see there's very distinct inheritance from the inoculum to the dams and the pups. We found that the ecology was perturbed in many different ways, and I'm just going to show you one example of this. This is using a jacquard 
uh, uh, distance. This is a measure of stability of the microbiome. Uh, uh, the higher the Jacquard score, the more unstable the microbiome is from time to time. And in the dams, we see that the stat inoculum leads to a more unstable uh, microbiome. And in the pups, in the next generation, their microbiome is more unstable as well. So the ecological effects move into the next generation. Perhaps more importantly is what's the effect on disease? So here we're looking at colonic pathology in the IL-10 mice at week 21 according to the microbiota to which their mothers were exposed. Here are the control, here's the, uh, uh, the mice whose mothers received the antibiotic perturbed microbiota. You can see a dramatic difference. Actually when we counted this, the difference is 55-fold uh, in one of our measures and about 20-fold in another measure. Very substantial difference. So to summarize the main point of this experiment is that this difference occurred even though these pups never saw antibiotics. In fact, their mothers never saw antibiotics. All they saw was a perturbed microbiota. So this meant that the en enhanced disease signal is entirely microbial. This provides evidence that the antib antibiotic effects can cross generations. It also gives us a new view about inheritance. We think about inheritance as the transfer of human genes, but it's also involved in the transference of microbes and their genes. And for many diseases, like IBD, human genetics only account for a small proportion of the risk. Perhaps this is one of the big missing items. So we continued this work by now looking at the metagenome of, of the microbiota. And this is a, another uh, PCA. Uh, here are the Here's the stat inoculum and the control inoculum. They're very different. Uh, and, and metagenome, we're, we're going to look at the, the structure of the metagenome here. Here's uh, in, the, uh, in the IL-10 mice, you can see stat and control are quite different. They're a little closer in the wild types. And now the question is, what's the function of the genes? Which of the genes are significantly different? Which are the pathways? We see that there are some pathways that are significant between control and STAT in the wild type. There are a lot more that are significant in the IL-10, which is not surprising. Uh, uh, the ones in blue, these are the ones that are associated with protection from disease. The ones in red are associated with promotion of disease because they're happening in the STAT mice. We find a number of pathways in the, uh, 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 in the controls. In the STAT, we just find a single significant pathway having to do with sulfate reduction. And this was interesting to us because there's a literature about sulfate reduction uh, in genes uh, in the microbiome in IBD from both other mouse studies and human studies. So we have independently found this. Uh, when we look at the uh, abundance of the genes in this pathway, we find that there, we can't find any, any abundance, any detectable abundance in the controls. We find it's more in the inoculum and, and we find it's uh, more in the in the mice that had received the stat microbiome, who, whose mothers received the stat microbiome. And then when we ask, those are the genes, what, what are the taxa that, that have these, uh, this pathway? We see uh, that it's mostly this, this brown taxon right here. It's almost exclusively the brown taxon. And when we say, well, what's brown taxon? It's an organism called Acromantia mucinophila, which has come up in many studies of the microbiome, in some cases as a bad actor and sometimes as a good actor. Here, it's associated with disease. So to summarize this work, this is a kind of discovery pathway in IBD, where we start with a disease uh, uh, with, with changed epidemiology, rising dramatically, a hypothesis that the microbiome is important, that it might uh, be affected by the prior generation. We develop a model, we find a phenotype, we look at the metagenome that helps us identify a pathway and a taxon, and that leads to new hypotheses to test. So this is a summary of the kind of work that I've shown you up to this point. Uh, we, we believe that there have been cumulative effects on the early life microbiome, with effects that we might consider to be due to deep inheritance, many generations, or middle life history, for example, uh, mothers taking antibiotics when they're teenagers, for example. 
Then there are effects during pregnancy, antibiotics, C-section, extensive washing of the baby. And then early childhood, postnatal, antibiotics, maternal antibiotics, formula, antibacterials. We believe that all of this is changing the composition of the microbiota, moving from a more ancestral microbiota to less ancestral, more opportunistic commensals. And the idea is that this is having effects that are transduced in the gut through the tissues, through the portal circulation affecting the liver and adipose tissues, through the lamina propria affecting lymphoid organs and bone marrows, through the vagus, hormones and neurotransmitters affecting the brain. This is our current hypothesis. In any event, this, this slide is the big picture. This is the same idea of this loss of diversity over multiple generations in a country like the United States where we've had modernization, let's say going back seven generations. Red line might be a country like India or China where modernization began later but is catching up in a big hurry. Yellow might be a country in Latin America or Africa where modernization is just beginning. So this, is, this, this was my view in 2016, and so, but the real question is what will the future bring? Is the microbiome going to continue to decline in diversity? Are, are we, and especially the young people in this room, are you going to be able to arrest the decline in the microbiota? Or will we reverse the decline through restorative steps? I think that ultimately we're going to have to have restoration. So my view of medicine of the future is that the doctor, the pediatricians of the future will do a new analysis of child health. In addition to examining babies, they're going to examine the baby's diaper. And they're going to ask, what microbes that all children should have is this baby lacking? And what personal microbes should this baby have but they don't have, based on their genotype and other markers? And the doctors of the future are going to administer those microbes to the babies of the future and see if they can optimize their health. Uh, and if not, maybe some of the new drugs will be aimed at the microbiome as well. So I want to finish by uh, recognizing many of the people who've done the work I've shown today, a number of uh, postdocs and graduate students I've highlighted here, uh, lots of different uh, uh, colleagues in many different areas of mouse studies, immunology, imaging, sequence analysis, support from the U.S. government and other aspects. And I, I want to finish by also plugging my book, <laughs> Missing Microbes. Uh, uh, you can see everyone is reading it. Uh, and, and what a great opportunity uh, with graduations, Mother's Day, and Father's Day <laughs> coming up. And uh, I think I have some more slides, but I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Here, and we have some time for questions. Yeah, that was great. Uh, so, the one variable you can't tackle so easily is the complexity of the host genome. Um, so, I wondered what your thoughts are on either modeling it without bred animals in uh, rodents, or how do you factor that in or integrate that in humans? Yeah, so the question is, is about the complexity of the host genome. And, you know, when we have diseases that are rising, it's not because the human gene pool has changed. When things have risen dr dramatically, it's happening within the human gene pool. And so we're, we're interested in those environmental effects that uh, have done this. And so we try to standardize genomes so that we are looking just within a single genotype. Sometimes it's useful to compare wild type and IL-10 deficient, for example, so that we can isolate it. And one could begin to do these studies in any different common, any different combinations of genotypes. Yeah. Now, I'm glad you ended with this slide because at the same time that neurolinguistic development is taking place in a child in the first 36 months is all this microbiotic change too. So, uh, can you relate those two, two things? Yeah, so, so the question is about uh, uh, neurolinguistic development and uh, uh, like many people, uh, I, I've noticed that autism is rising. Uh, that autism has risen dramatically since, uh, since World War II. By conservative estimates, about 400 percent. So the, this is a disease that expresses very early in life. Uh, and uh, the cause is unknown. Uh, it's, a, it's a tenable hypothesis that, uh, that 
the change in the microbiome has some relationship to autism. People are working on this field right now. It's an active area of exploration. Yes. 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 I have two questions. You briefly uh, alluded to Helicobacter pylori at some point, but with antibiotics we may eradicate uh, Helicobacter pylori in kids. So what, what will happen? Because we know that it's a risk yeah. uh, factor or protective factor against yeah. the immune yeah. disease. Yeah. And my second question is that what could be the intervention in kids that we can use to restore the uh, yeah. microbiome? Should it be yeah. diet, probiotics? Yeah. So two questions, Professor Colin Bell. The first about Helicobacter, uh, and of course that's like another hour's lecture. <laughs> but um, but the, the bottom line is that Helicobacter was discovered in the 19th century as a commensal. Then it was rediscovered in the 20th century as a pathogen. It's still the same organism. Uh, and it's clear that there's a biological cost to having Helicobacter, including peptic ulcer disease and gastric cancer. There's more and more evidence that there's a biological benefit to having Helicobacter, including protection of the esophagus against esophageal disease, uh, immune protections, and there's more and more evidence that Helicobacter protects against asthma, and that the disappearance of Helicobacter is one of the things that's fueling asthma. There's both epidemiologic and experimental work, including work that we've done as well. So Helicobacter is a complex story, and in fact, it's the canary in the coal mine. It, it was the disappearance of Helicobacter that led me to begin to think that if one organism is disappearing, then other ones are disappearing as well. And we, we and others have found such disappearing organisms. Uh, your second question is, how do we restore? I think that restoration is going to have to be microbes. Uh, diet will only select for certain, for the microbes that are there. But if, if microbes are missing, if, if our diversity has really gone down as dramatically as it appears, we can only get back by re replenishing those taxa that are missing, or some representative taxa. Diet will be an important way to select for useful organisms, but wouldn't be sufficient. Um, how successful has uh, uh, microbial transplants been in diabetes and obesity, and how long-lasting are the effects? How successful have the microbiota transfers been in diabetes and obesity? There have been some studies. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I don't think they have been particularly dramatic or successful possibly at all. But the question is that if somebody has a disease that's been established going on for decades, uh, I'm not sure that microbiota transfer uh, is going to be the best way to go. It might be helpful. I think we have to think about the origins of the disease in childhood uh, to prevent the disease from occurring during a critical developmental period. So that's, that's where our focus is, is on early life. Yes. Uh, uh, so have you looked at which specific species in the microbiome are either uh, missing or enhanced? Have you looked at whether that any of these species produce some product that affects the immune system or the activation of genes? Yeah. Yeah, so yes, this is a very active area of research uh, in our lab and in many labs, including studies here at Mount Sinai. Uh, for example, uh, I showed about our, our IBD model where we've identified an organism, Acromancia, we've identified a pathway. Uh, one of the hopes is that we can do studies in which we vary microbial populations by the presence or absence of acromancia to look at the very specific effects on host genes and on, on phenotype. There are many other organisms. We're working on a bacterium uh, in the gut called oxalobacter that eats oxalate. Uh, many of you know that uh, uh, the majority of kidney stones are, are due to calcium oxalate. Kidney stones are a rising disease. It's one of these modern plagues as well. They've been rising dramatically. And there's more and more evidence that oxalobacter is disappearing. So we're beginning to do studies based on the metabolic activity of, of oxalobacter. Okay, well, thanks so much, Dr. Blazer.